There's something special about experiencing the Bible in the land of the Bible. The first time I ever saw this beautiful land of Israel, I was with my family, and I was only eight years old. I had no way of knowing how special it would become to me over the years to come. But this trip is different. My wife, Jane Austen, and all of our children and their spouses are here. This is probably a once in a lifetime opportunity, and I want to make the most of it by studying the scriptures as we go through the land of the Bible. This is a special time for my family and I. We've never been together on a trip to Israel. This is a special time because we're enjoying being together and it's a special place to be together and it gives them a renewed love for the scripture. It's just an eye-opening trip to be able to actually see the gospel. I hope that it's a, a living testimony that I can bring home. This is amazing. This is just where Jesus touched people's lives and changed them forever. It's almost hard to take in. You know, when my children were little kids, they enjoyed going on adventures. Back then, it was in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Today, we're exploring near the Sea of Galilee, a place where Jesus spent most of the three years of his ministry right here. One day, as Jesus was walking with his disciples, a man who lived among the tombs came out to meet him. Outwardly, he was wild, he was dangerous. Inwardly, he is being tormented by demons. This man lived in the tombs, and no one can bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. Well, Sissy, that happened somewhere here. And we see back here, uh, we see these caves uh, around us. And uh, just think of this uh, crazy man, demon-possessed man, screaming and yelling day and night. And he had supernatural strength that when they chained him, just popped the chains like they weren't even there. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and were drowned. Up here on this hill is a, the remnants of a, of a Roman community. And of course, the Romans ate pigs. Jews didn't, but the, the Romans did. So this very well could be the site. Pigs could have run right down that hill and ran into the sea down here and drowned. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Everybody here knew him. Just think of this demon possessed man screaming and yelling day and night. What impresses me, Sissy, about this is when the man came to his right mind, every, like everybody else, he wanted to follow Jesus right then. But Jesus said, no, I want you to go home. And I want you to tell your family, and I want you to tell the good things the Lord has done for you. 
and how important it is for all of us to be a witness at home. Not everybody is called to go to the ends of the earth, but we are called to be a witness to where God puts us in life. I bet there were thousands of people that are in heaven because this man said, let me tell you what the Lord did for me. See, he obeyed the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, go home, and he obeyed. Meeting Jesus transforms your life. And you can't help but to tell others how good God has been to you. Seeing the Sea of Galilee, the views are just incredible and impressive. And the Bible comes alive to you and you can see where you know, Jesus has walked and where he has taught. This is actually the things that you've read about all these years in your Bible, and it's wonderful. It makes me want to dig deeper into the scriptures and makes me want to go home and study more. This is amazing. This is just where Jesus was, where he touched people's lives and transformed them and changed them forever. Our next stop takes us south towards the Dead Sea and to the nearby city of Jericho. It's one of the oldest cities in the world, and it's a place where the life of a sinner was changed forever. We're in Jericho, and several great stories in the Bible took place right here as Jesus was on his way to the cross and two people that he met. And uh, the first one they met, uh, you're gonna tell us about Donna. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Zacchaeus, who is a corrupt public official, he was a tax collector, he cheated people. Zacchaeus heard Jesus was coming, but being a, a little guy, he couldn't see over the crowd. So he runs ahead and he climbs a, a tree like this. And he sits up there and Jesus comes and he sees Zacchaeus and he stops. He calls Zacchaeus by name. And you know, Jesus knows our name, knows everything about us. And he looked at Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, come down quickly. I'm gonna to come to your house today. The Lord Jesus Christ is wanting to come into each and every one of our hearts and he wants to come stay. And uh, Zacchaeus, the Bible says, he welcomed him. And then he, he said, if I've cheated anybody, I'm going to pay them back. I'm going to give half my possessions to the poor. I'll pay back fourfold if I've taken anything by false accusation. And so by coming to Jesus, he immediately wanted to make his life right. He wanted to be restored in fellowship with other people that he cheated. And I think that's just evidence of a changed life. Imagine living in this part of the world and not being able to see any of the beauty of a sunrise or a sunset or the mountain ranges. But then you hear that Jesus is passing your way. Jesus was leaving Jericho. Again, a large crowd was with him. And he meets another great individual. You wanna read it? Sure. And he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat on the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out loud and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus is leaving the city. And again, there's a lot of people probably yelling, Jesus, over here, Jesus, you know, Jesus, come see me. Jesus, I want to talk to you. But there was one voice that cried out in faith. Jesus, have mercy on me. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I might receive my sight. And then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. 
Jesus stopped in his tracks, right along here somewhere, stopped in his tracks. Jesus will stop for anybody who calls his name in faith, anybody. You know, for us as children, we would learn scripture together. We would have devotions as a family, reading the scriptures, telling Bible stories. And we always loved Dad because Dad would make it interesting. Shall we move on? Let's go. <laughs> oh, yeah, there we go. Arms are out. Did you know that in every Jewish grave, there's a light, an Israelite? <laughs> Make sure we get that one on video. Camel time. Camel time. You know, it was a new family experience. I saw Lawrence of Arabia. I'm a natural. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Own this journey through the Holy Land on DVD as a thank you for any gift of ministry support. This DVD also includes bonus materials from Billy Graham and the previous devotion series, Seven Days in the Holy Land. Call now or go to billygram.tv. This is the ancient city of Jerusalem. It's not a large city by today's standards at all but it's impacted and changed the course of history and still is today. Two thousand years ago, down a street similar to this, someone came looking for Jesus and he was searching for truth. Jesus had a very religious man uh, come to visit him, a man who had a question. So I'm going to ask Corey uh, to read uh, in John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Nicodemus was searching and a religion didn't satisfy. There was an emptiness and he comes to Jesus at night with his question. And Jesus says, you know, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit and we have to be born again. And Nicodemus asked a very good question. Do I enter my mother's womb a second time? You know, he's just, how does this work? And uh, Jesus reveals to him that we have to be born of spirit as well. And that's when we come to put our faith in Christ. After he had that conversation with Jesus, he put his faith and trust in him. And he was a secret follower until Jesus was crucified. And now he was no secret follower because he stood out from the rest of those Pharisees. At that point, Nicodemus didn't care who saw him. He takes a stand and he publicly goes and gets the body and they put it in the, in the tomb. I'm sure when the word came around town, he's risen. Nicodemus was probably, yeah, I knew this was happening. I knew he would do it. He conquered the grave, that's right. It's a great passage, and one of my favorite verses, Jesus says right here, that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shouldn't perish, but should have everlasting life. My question to you today, if you put your faith and trust in Christ, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. The only way we can come to God is through faith 
in Jesus Christ. It's not by being religious. It's not by how many prayers you pray or how many candles you light. By grace are we saved through faith, and it's not of works. God loves you, and Christ died for our sins, and he rose from the grave. He's alive, and he'll come into every heart that is willing to yield to him and trust him by faith. If you haven't put your faith and trust in Christ, you can do it right now, wherever you are. Just pray this prayer. Just say, God, I have sinned, and I'm sorry. Forgive me. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son, that he died for my sins, that he rose from the grave. And I'd like to invite him to come into my heart, to take control of my life from this day forward, forever. It's interesting to see this place through the eyes of my family, especially those who hadn't been here before. The smell of the spices, the incense, the sound of shopkeepers selling their merchandise to eager tourists passing by. This is Jerusalem's old city. Although full of beautiful things, this city is so much more than just a tourist attraction. This is the city where Jesus would pay the ultimate price for your sins and for mine. Jesus knew that his death was, was near and that he would be going to the cross for the sins of mankind. He told his disciples to go into the city and you'll see a man with a jar. Follow him and go to the house that he enters and tell the owner of that house, our master is looking for the room. I'd like uh, Edward to read from Luke chapter 22 uh, what happened that evening. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Remember they were celebrating the Passover and we have to go back to remembering what the Passover was. The night that they left Egypt, the blood of the lamb was put on the doorpost. And every doorpost that had the blood of the, that lamb, the angel of death, passed over. If you didn't have the blood of the lamb, then the angel took the firstborn of that family. And so here Jesus is celebrating a Passover. And he said, I eagerly have been looking forward to this time with you. And of course, then he took the bread. He said, this is my body that I'm giving for you. Then he took the cup, this wine. So this is my blood that's being poured out. The Passover, Jesus Christ shed his blood so that death would pass over us. He died for our sins. And so anyone who puts their faith and trust in Christ, His blood, God sees that blood and He passes over any judgment on us. The next day after the Last Supper, Jesus Christ went to the cross. He went there to take our sins. And on the third day, God raised His Son to life. And He will save each and every one who is willing to believe on His name. Without the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Christianity would be just another empty religion. But because He conquered death, we have hope for this life, and we have hope for the life to come.
After the resurrection of Jesus, the two Marys ran to the disciples to tell them uh, what just took place, that, that they saw the tomb was empty. It's recorded where two of them went to the town of Emmaus, along a road uh, very similar to where we are right now. We have these two men walking along and just talking to themselves what, uh, what had happened. And then Jesus is there among them. And they don't recognize him, they just uh, keep walking. And then he opens up the scriptures and from Moses through the prophets explains why it had to happen. But they constrained him saying, abide with us for it's toward evening and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did our heart not burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scripture to us? So they rose that very hour and they returned to Jerusalem and found the 11. And they told about these things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. These were two discouraged people and they represented really all the disciples, all the followers of Jesus who were disappointed. They thought this was the one that was gonna come and redeem Israel, take us away from Roman oppression. And uh, they were sad, and all of them were. These were just two examples of it. But here he comes and he gives them hope. And so I think it's just a, a representation of these two men and what God was bringing to all of humanity. There was a sense of hopelessness for all the world, but now hope has now come because of the resurrection. After his resurrection, Jesus came to the Sea of Galilee, where his disciples had returned to fishing. This was the place where Jesus had first gathered his disciples, teaching them to trust him. He said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. So many things happened right here. Storms took place. Healing took place. This is where Jesus was. This is where he lived. Close to this place right here, something happened. Let's see what we can learn uh, from John chapter 21. Kendra? Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to them, we'll also come with you. Then they went out and they got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. He yells at the guys and he calls, he calls them friends. Friends! <laughs> got any fish? They were probably downcast. We haven't got a thing. Throw your nets on the other side. Now they got 153 fish. And John said to Peter, it's the Lord. That's the Lord on the beach. And so when they got out upon the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and the fish placed upon it in bread. It was the, the last time that Jesus that we know of was with his disciples. And I think of um, having breakfast with Jesus, what that means. He brings the food. He already had the fire built. He already had the, the fish. He already had the bread. And he'll feed you spiritually. As you read his word, he'll open up the word of God to you. You'll have understanding that you can't believe. I love that it was a charcoal fire. You know, I think of um, the different smells that you smell and it puts you in different places. Mm -hmm. The last time Peter smelled that charcoal fire, was when he was betraying mm -hmm. Jesus. When, when the rubber hit the road, he, he ran. Mm -hmm. 
Peter disobeyed and he had rejected him and had run. So he'd gone back to fishing. And the Lord uh, restored him, restored him right there. And that's what happens when you have breakfast with Jesus. Not only can, uh, can he feed you spiritually, but when we have fallen away, when we have sinned, when we have turned our back on him, when we have breakfast with him, he'll restore us. We, we, all, we all fail. That guy who turned his back and ran, he was filled with power and God used Peter in a mighty way. And he's got a plan and he's got a purpose for all of us. Before we leave this land of the Bible, and we've seen a lot. And sometimes it's, it's hard to soak it all in. And you need a little time just to reflect. Let's take a few minutes and reflect a little bit. What an incredible opportunity to come and visit this country and to see how God, how the New Testament and Scripture continues to live today. That's what I'm taking away from this trip. These were real people, these are real stories. To me, to sense it through my senses, it was, it was, I'll never forget the, the feelings and the tastes and the, the sights that I saw. You see the hill of the skull, and that's where all God's wrath was poured out on himself. For us, I mean, that's powerful love. Then you go to the tomb and it's empty and there's hope. My heart is overwhelmed with thankfulness and awe, so grateful for a God like that. A special moment is when we were all standing on the Mount of Olives together, where Dad surrendered his life to Christ. When I was 22, uh, this little hotel right up here above us, I uh, was there one night that I got on my knees and I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. And this is where God spoke to me. So I always come up here and I look out over the city and I'm always just thankful for what God has done in my life. God has taken the scripture and there are no mistakes. And he's kept his promises all the way through and his promise was Christ and his hope is Christ. So that brings me great joy. This trip has reminded us all that Jesus we read about, he is still at work changing hearts, redeeming all who will repent of their sins and are willing to call on his name and trust him. The Billy Graham Evangelistic Association continues to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Your prayers and support are crucial to our ongoing ministry. Partner with us and receive your copy of Return to the Holy Land. Call now or go to billygram.tv.